Hey everyone, Jake Pentland here. You may know me as Roseanne Barson and the occasional person uh, on this podcast outside of the guest that talks. I wouldn't say co-host. I don't think I have that important of a role, but uh, I'm definitely all over the place on this podcast and um, you know, also producing and editing and blah, blah, blah. So uh, first things first, I wanted to say thank you all uh, for supporting us and listening to us. The numbers have been great. The, the reviews as much as you can on the podcast tell, uh, we look at comments and uh, they've been great and encouraging and we're, we're really encouraged that, that you guys are liking the show. We want this to continue growing. This is a, a long-term commitment my mother's made to, to do a show weekly. It's not a vanity project. It's not something she does because she's bored. It's not like when a, you know, Billy Bob Thornton starts a band or something horrible. Like, oh, God, here's another celebrity doing something we simply don't give a shit about. This is really the best place. If you're a fan of my mother, this is the best place to get her unfiltered opinion. Um, it's one of the last places she can talk where they haven't canceled her from yet. So we really appreciate the support. Um, and, you know, the best way to support us is to like share and subscribe this show help us get it out help us get the numbers up um, we're doing well but we can always do better also i want to say those of you that went to uh, bh-pm.com to talk to andrew about um, purchasing precious metals uh, i'm really encouraged by the numbers i see a lot of you are protecting your wealth I, because you say it came from Roseanne, we can track the leads and uh, a significant amount of you are taking it very seriously and i think that's very smart as we know the dollar is unstable the economy is unstable and the best thing you can do right now it could change but right now is to put as much of your money in precious metals as you can um and you can see that episode here on our youtube channel with andrew the gold guy um we're very encouraged by that and uh anyway now onto the episode i just want to be very clear that this episode we filmed with scott adams uh is one of my favorite but it was filmed before the Maui fires. And the reason I'm telling you that is because there is a portion of this episode where my mother and him are discussing uh, slow-moving disasters, and uh, they make mention of being stuck in traffic and not being able to get out. And, it, you know, if this was recorded after the Maui fires, that would have been very insensitive to talk about it that way. Uh, so I just want to be clear. Um, this was supposed to be last week's episode. We preempted it with Anomaly uh, to discuss the Maui fires because that was obviously a very important story uh, and one that was personally important to us as well. Uh, my mother is a citizen of Hawaii. Um, so I just want to be clear when you're hearing them talk about being stuck in traffic and disasters that it was no way uh, about uh, the Maui fires. And lastly, and most importantly, I want to say that this episode, because Scott was not in person, was filmed uh, via Zoom. And unfortunately, I don't know the state of the audio uh, until the end of the episode when it uploads. We don't have great internet here where we live. And unfortunately, my mother's audio, specifically in the first few minutes, uh, is popping and probably very irritating to listen to. More irritating than her natural voice. Um, I just want to say stick with it. It's a great episode. Her audio does get better. Um, and like I said, there's not anything I can do about it. But uh, don't turn it off. Uh, if it annoys you, just stick it out. The conversation is brilliant. Scott Adams has a, a Malcolm Gladwell-esque uh, approach to things. And, um, you know, I find this episode, even though it's subdued and intellectual, it's one of my favorite we've recorded. You know, we like to give you something different every week. Sometimes we're getting high. Sometimes we're getting deep in conspiracy theories. And other times we're just shooting the shit with really, really smart people. And that's what this episode is. So the best thing you can do to help us, aside from visiting sponsors like bh-pm.com and letting them know Roseanne sent you, that helps, is to like, share, and subscribe. We want as many people to see this episode as possible. And I'm not sure that the episodes are showing up in the algorithm of YouTube uh, in, the, in the most efficient way on their end, that's all I'll say. So um, sharing, liking, um, subscribing, that's the best way you can support us. All right, enough of my um, begging. I just wanna say enjoy this episode and we will see you next week where we will be joined by Jack Posobiec. The following week will be JP Sears. So we got some good episodes coming to you. So anyway, thanks again for the support. Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to the Roseanne Barr podcast. So you see. So I'm very excited to have uh, as a guest today uh, the author of Dilbert and a new book too that he'll hold up and we'll talk about Scott Adams. 
<laughs> Hi, Scott. Hi, Rosa. Hi. Thanks I like the me. title of your. Oh, thanks for coming on. I love that the title of your book is Reframe Your Brain, right? Reframe Your Brain. Yeah, it should be out just about the time people see this. I'm just going through the final edits and it'll be ready to go. What's you know, about? I'm all yes, about part. programming your brain. I'm all about that. And uh, specifically, since we have this in common, as we're both uh, labeled racist by the United States racist media, um, <laughs> I love seeing you on Cuomo, and I mostly enjoyed so much Cuomo lecturing you on responsibility for what you say. <laughs> I loved it. You know, he, he was really nice to me. Uh, I thought he did a solid job of journalism on I that. I did too. I think you and I have one thing in common, which is interesting in our in our two controversies, which I don't think that anybody actually believed him. Uh, as Nobody in, I don't think anybody him. actually think you're a racist. I don't think anybody actually thinks I am. I haven't met anybody. I mean, in person, not a single person believes anything like that. But the average uh, viewer of the news doesn't understand that public figures are generally used as sort of a conduit for other people's opinions. So if they can find any way to define you as the, you know, the hub of the, the place they can load their opinion on and, and put it through you, then it's really just a vehicle for other people to express their opinions. So what you, you actually said or what you actually meant and what I actually said and what I actually meant never really came up. It was no. like that wasn't an really important part of the process. You know, if anybody it removed me, context. Say, yeah, I mean that's that's sort of what. Now the thing that the the average viewer of news doesn't realize, and you of course would know it better than anybody, the news about public figures is almost never real. Almost no, never. never. Probably yeah. nine out of ten times they're leaving out the important part of the story. You know, they they might get a fact right, like if somebody died. Usually right. <laughs> but if it's somebody said something or was alleged to say something, in my experience, those are almost never true. I'm really puzzled about whether things have gotten worse or we got smarter about how bad they were. There, there's definitely more both. canceling going on. That's for sure. I think both. Uh, we got smarter, so um, they got more pervasive in their mind control over the airwaves. Yeah, at this point, the ability to hide a major story is the scariest part of the media you know, situation. It's not what they say that's not true, that's bad enough, but they can make a major story just disappear. Well, I, I know you're concerned about uh, the uh, indictment of Trump, and I like that you said, uh, don't say weaponization of the, of the Department of Justice, say destruction. Yeah, you know, I don't think people fully realize that everything about America that works is based on the foundation of the justice system and the fact that ours is better than most. You know, you, you, the reason you come to America, among other reasons, is that the justice system, you know, gives you a chance of, you know, not being jailed for the wrong reasons and running your company and not running into too much trouble with other criminals. But if we lose that, that's it's somewhat irreparable. I mean, everything else would collapse. And I think we're taking some pretty big shots at it with, uh, you know, what's going on lately with the, this, with Trump specifically. I mean, to me, I don't know anybody who's following the story who thinks that's legitimate. I know, I know a lot of people who are not aware that, for example, questioning the electors has been a historical thing. It's happened. People don't seem to understand that Republicans don't hold insurrections without weapons. Hmm. Like that somehow we were sold the idea that Republicans would, would launch a coup and they wouldn't bring weapons and that the way they would conquer the United States is by sauntering around the Capitol for a few <laughs> hours until the government surrendered. I don't know, were they waiting for I mean, the surrender? Talk about, and point. it's so, it's so uh, horrifying to think that to think that it was that easy to overthrow the government of the United States uh, with yeah. all those police and everything around, letting them do it, knowing that they were there to overthrow the government. How easy was that? You know, you think the nuclear triad would have been more important, but no. People with uh, bison hats and 
and, <laughs> and whatnot. So today I heard from Dershowitz, um, he said that uh, the Jack Smith indictment uh, included language from Trump's speech, and they did not include in the indictment where he said the peaceful and patriotic part, the most no. important part they of it. They purposely left, left that out. out. Yeah, what, Scott, what you, so you made a good point. Me about what I, I wanted Scott to talk Sorry. more because he. I watched that video, Scott, your podcast about this, um, about how Jack Smith is basically committing the crime that he's accusing Trump of. I wanted you to explain that a little bit more. It's brilliant. So th this is a Dershowitz, Dershowitz's point, uh, Ellen Dershowitz. He was saying mm -hmm. that if the crime that Trump is committing was not telling the truth and that therefore that had repercussions in the real world, that Jack Smith is also not telling the truth by leaving out the key part, you know, it's a lie by omission in the indictment. They're both, you know, they, they both have something important to do with our government and with the country. And it's hard to see, you know, I don't know about the technical legal details that, you know, Dershowitz can talk about that, but it looks the same. It looks mm -hmm. like somebody yeah. lying. The difference is, the difference is that, Trump may have said something in a political context, which everybody should understand, includes some untruths. <laughs> but but if you see it in an indictment, I'm sorry, those are not the same. Those are no, not, the same. not the same. Well, one of them is the worst thing in the world, and the other one is just somebody talking. The, the yes. fact that we've found one of, that the one talking is the one going to jail, and the one doing the worst thing in the world is the one putting him in jail, and, and we're just well okay already with they. They've already been caught with making up fake FISAs, fake dossiers. They've already been caught, and everybody knows that's the truth. And yet, nothing. They're they're never indicted, and people see uh, that there is a dual a dual tiered a two tiered system of justice: one for the establishment, and one for everybody who's not in the establishment, and trying to make change or expose it. Yeah, you know, the, the most amazing thing that boggles my mind is that we've now learned enough about, let's say, the laptop and the 50 <laughs> Intel people who, who uh, lied about that. We know about the Russia collusion hoax. You know, Siri, get out of here. Oh, my <laughs> God. The sound screwed up, Jake. What's happened? The sound, wow. Siri came on. Uh -oh. Is it still doing it? I don't hear it. Well, uh, let me get rid of it, that bitch. Sorry, I wanted to center your camera. That Siri bitch. I hate that bitch. <laughs> okay. I, I'm sorry to ha have interrupted you. Continue, please. Uh, what was I saying? Oh, and so we found out the laptop story that was all faked, and it was also, it wasn't just fake, but it was a fairly massive collusion. You know, a lot of people yes. had to be in on it. Then, you know, of course, we know the Russia collusion hoax was fairly massive in terms of how many people were in on it. And now we're learning about the, you know, the Biden family business and how that worked. We now know, I think we know the entire structure of it. There, yes, we do. There are not, not many questions left. Now, I don't know what's legal and illegal. I think Hunter might have been clever enough to, you know, be on the right side of the law. I'm no expert. I don't know. But the fact that the way it's being presented to the public it is just a, a complete, uh, just a cover up. And how many, yes, how many cover up. illusions on the same side, followed by a media cover up, do we have to see before we make some kind of change? I'm hoping it's an elect election change. What about this? That Trump had the right to have those papers under the presidential, uh, whatever it's called, I forget. But he had the right to have those classified papers as the president of the United States. But Biden had them as a senator and as a vice president, which is highly illegal. And he doesn't get indicted for that. They're laying around his garage and he yeah. took him to Chinatown where China owned the building he was renting, handed him out in the street. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know the, the technical details of what you know what's the difference between those two cases but here's the thing allegedly the dog, allegedly but the dog that's not barking really loud right now is we've not heard one peep about what the contents of trump's boxes are now right. the only reason that could be is because there's nothing important there 
There could not be any other reason. Because if, in fact, it were you know, nuclear secrets or something like that, you don't think that they would tell us, at least in broad strokes, hey, there were nuclear secrets? You know, They don't have to tell us the secret. I would imagine he probably had some things that would sort of defend him in the future or you know, maybe make his situation look better. I would imagine most of it's just for a biography. You know, I, I assume it they, could have been for that too, but I think he has the Epstein list and every tentacle that it reached out to from the 28 bank hack of HSBC bank, which they covered up for all these years. And, uh, you know, I think he has it all. I mean, I love, I, I really wanted to talk to you about being left of Bernie because I am, but anyways, um, uh, I'm forgetting what I'm saying. What am I saying, son? Oh, you want, reparations. You we agree yeah. on this. Reparations. We agree, I'm sure. And it should be of infrastructure starting with schools. That is reparations to the black community. And that's how we can do it. We can put infrastructure where they live instead of bringing in fentanyl from the border to destroy that community. And I think that... It is a genocide on black America going on and nobody's talking about it because the only people that are allowed to talk are people that are in on the yank. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would agree with you that the, uh, the biggest source of systemic racism is the school system because its inadequacies are you know, multiplied in the black community. So it's, it's sort of a forever problem. But and because it ain't no, it isn't a mistake. It's on purpose. Is it on purpose by who? By the institution of, uh, by institutionalized racism. And, oh. you know, you look at who supports it and it's not who you think, you know, uh, it's not who you think at all. It's people who are in on the yank. They're getting paid off government money to keep the shit going. They don't want to change anything. They don't want to use public money for the good of the public. Come on, it's all corrupt, every bit of it, every stinking tear of it. Well, the, the and part I was cannot the... believe that these people are out there applauding a compromised and corrupt justice system that sits there and uh, invents and you know perverts law to get an innocent person in jail when that's what's happened to a whole bunch of black men in this country. And they're applauding for it. I uh, want people to snap out of their stupor, and I want them to do it right now. And I'm pissed about it. I, I've joked that uh, Trump is one indictment away from winning the black vote. Yeah, and, he is. And, and I'm, I'm only a little bit kidding about that because I actually think that the, the Justice Department is so so corrupted that he could say, "Look, uh, the Justice Department doesn't work." For me, imagine how bad it is for you. Elect me yes. and I'll fix it for all of us. Now, I'm not sure if you could do that because, you know, a lot of the Well, but you know that these judges, local. they're only doing it because they're getting paid off. So, it, so if, you know, they go and pay the judge to convict, you know, they've done it a million times to convict the nearest black man. They've done it a million times. I'm here in Texas. They've done it a million times here in Texas. A lot. You know, uh, and I'm, everybody's supposed to ignore that while they're doing it to Trump. Yeah, I'm, the new I'm, black man. I'm definitely willing to believe that there's you know massive injustice from the top to the bottom. So, but in, we have something in common. Accidentally, I mean, the entire public now is being abused by the Department of Justice. So we weirdly have something in common. And look how they did to us. Look at all the things they've done to us to destroy our freedom of speech. It's just terrifying. But we have to find a way to wake people up. And uh, I know that that's why you said what you said, like I heard you on Chris Cuomo. You get the big attention and then you come back and reframe and explain. That's the only way you can get anything on the media now. Yeah, the, uh, the reframe that I was trying to uh, promote is that we're at a point in history where um, the you know, affirmative action and you know real aggressive race-based policies probably did help a lot in the past. Probably that's the reason that we have diversity in, in businesses. 
probably, probably it was one of the best things that America's ever done to make sure that everything was inclusive. But it is logical and obvious that at some point you have to stop doing that because it's hurting more than it's helping. And it's going to take basically people like me who don't mind getting canceled to start calling out when the, the crossover happens. And that's what I was trying to do. So in my mind, the, the CEI, the, um, the ESG, the, the DEI, uh, the, C, not the CRT, uh, they, uh, they all have in common that they demonize white people for mm-hmm. the benefit of a class that uh, would benefit if they can change things. So you don't want to live around that situation. In other words, you, mm-hmm. you want to reduce that as much as possible. Now, when I, I hyperbolically said, get the hell away, there's no practical way to do that. Nobody would want to do that. That should never have been taken seriously. It was hyperbole. But here's what can be done. We can absolutely make sure that every black kid and every other kid learns how to succeed in a, on a personal level. In other words, if you teach them the, the tools of success that have worked for every person everywhere of every type at every income level, they're going to do fine. Will they do as well as some other group? You know, I don't care. I, I feel like I need to stop caring about this weird average of one group versus the average of another. I cared a lot when the averages were, you know, completely you know, out of whack, right? You care a lot then. But once it gets close, even if it's not even, you got to drop the stuff that's creating more problems than it's solving. And I think at this point we have to switch to individual success strategies. I'm actually uh, working with uh, Joshua Lysak to build a, uh, a student guide that's based on my books, uh, these two. This will come out pretty soon. But it's basically guides for uh, personal success. And, you know, I came from a low-income situation. I'm, I'm guessing you probably did too, as well, low-income situation. And if you simply do the things that people have always done to succeed, you've got a really, really good chance in America. And if the averages of that two, is correct. if the averages of two you know groups that somebody decided have to be measured are different, I'm not sure that that's the problem anymore. Because show me show me a, a black kid who went to school, stayed off drugs, uh, studied, and uh, developed a skill or a set of skills that the marketplace valued and didn't do well. Does that person even exist? Yeah, it's sure. sort of like I always say, you know, show me the homeless engineer. Uh, unless, unless they have a mental problem. Well, like, you never know about that once you bring in drugs, you know, and alcohol. Right. There's a lot, probably a lot of them. But, uh, you know, everyone should uh, have the right to be have a public school that's a place that actually teaches them how to get along in this world that we actually live in so they can be employed and have a gainful future, which they refuse to do. They don't think that that is important at all. Yeah, the thing I always notice... They're, they're trying to manufacture child soldiers. Yeah. Have you ever noticed that when you meet a black conservative, they're doing well? Mm-hmm. <laughs> they're always doing yeah. well. And it's because they have a set of rules that everybody has always used for success. And they just use the rules and now they're doing well. So if we don't... Well, so do rappers that live within million dollar mansions. They they don't talk about it unless they, when they're launching their fourth clothing line, then they begin to talk about yeah. discipline but, and all that yeah. other stuff. But, but, if, but if you're talking about like Jay-Z or uh, uh, even Ye, mm-hmm. I mean, he's controversial, of course, but... If you look at his work ethic, amazing, yeah, amazing work ethic, and he built. He's a, probably a conservative when they do their taxes. <laughs> well, once you get money, you turn conservative real fast. Yeah. Didn't you find that out, Scott? If you came from working class background, you know, I, I haven't examined my history to know if I've changed my opinion that much. But let's see, I grew up in a Republican town. I became kind of, uh, I felt a little, you know, lefty when I was young, and but I wasn't paying attention to much, right? The more you pay attention, oh. the more the more you dig down, the more... Uh, I, I, don't, I don't identify as conservative. 
because, like I say, I'm left to Bernie on some things. I'll give you some examples. Everybody always asks, what's that mean? But I bet you ain't, I bet you're conservative on putting your money in the bank. Well, uh, you mean conservative about money in general? Yes. Oh, yeah, of course. Because money is not politics, right? National, right? national defense is not politics. So if you tell me you know, a question about the military or the economy, I don't even know that there's you know, a Democrat or Republican way to look at that. I just look at, okay, you know, who, who's going to be gored and who's going to make money in this plan? And that's sort of all there is. But if you, but if you take, I'll, I'll give you some examples of why I say I'm left to Bernie. Okay. So Republicans might say they don't like abortion. Democrats might say, yes, we'd like it under certain conditions. And I go further than that to the left. And I say, uh, people like me should stay out of it. People like me who don't have babies. <laughs> people like me who can't have a baby. I would now, of course, nobody should give up the right to vote or have an opinion. But I think that the best uh, abortion law would be the one that is backed by the most women in the country, and maybe by state. That makes sense, you know, to make it make it local. But uh, l- let's imagine that the men wanted abortion to be illegal. The women wanted it to be legal. You wouldn't want the men to work to, to win in that situation. That's not a stable country. You, you, the most stable situation is where the people closest to the decision got to make the decision. And that might be different by state. Yeah, but that never happens. <laughs> Which part? Never happens. The people who have to live with the decision are never the ones making the decision. Oh, well, that's true. I, I'm just saying that as a, as a citizen... I feel I should not influence that uh, that conversation, but I try pretty hard to influence. Well, I think you that. should. What does that make me? I think every person should have a voice in this. But it's a huge thing. Hold, hold it's on. torn our country apart for decades. Hold on, there's a, there's a nuance here that I'm not explaining well. When you have a situation, okay. when you have a situation where you know nobody will agree, and abortion is one of those, you're not mm-hmm. you're not going to win anybody over, and it's also life and death. And it's also vital. It's such a big topic. It's vital to the, you know, the, the cohesion of the country. When the stakes are that high and you can't decide and you know you'll never win an argument, the default, and this is the important part, in that situation, the best solution is that you have the most credible set of laws, not the best ones. So the most credible ones are the, that the people who are, uh, let's say, most skin in the game uh, looked into it and collectively, they said, you know, we're, we're the closest to this. This is what we think. And then people like me, who are sort of outside that circle, can say, you know what? I'm not even sure I agree with what you decided, but I definitely agree that you're the right people to decide it. So if you can't get the right decision, which really is not, it's not a possibility because we're so polarized on that. If you can't get the right decision, the next best thing you can do is get the right people to be the dominant part of the decision. I think if common sense was introduced, which it has never been, if it was for once introduced, a compromise could appear that everyone could accept. And that's what I like. I -hmm. I like the power of words and conversation in order to access together a common sense solution to every problem because we do have the brains and the wherewithal and the intelligence uh even if sometimes i say even if we have to manufacture it artificially but we do have access to the intelligence to be able to solve each and every situation and and problem facing us we do but if we don't i like that you said when you don't monetize the problem you can better solve it yeah i but i think with the uh the question of abortion, there's no conversation that would get you really close to any kind of a agreed central. I think there is. And here's what I say. So put this under your hat and smoke it or whatever the old lady thing is. I'm uh, I'll smoke Boomer. It. Boomer talk. Huh? I'll smoke it. What? Just give it to me. I'll smoke it. Okay. <laughs> I think it should be between a woman and her doctor. And it's nobody else's damn business to try to politicize it. And I think that everyone should get together in a room and, you know, accessing 
the greatest data that we have available to us, uh, whether that being inside the womb feels pain or not, because in our new world, there's going to be one commandment. Well, there's going to be a really important commandment, which is no cruelty. And so I think that using all of that in a higher mind where we're intelligent and not base creatures that crawl on the earth, but we use our mind, will go, well, what week is that? Mm -hmm. And it will between the, be between the intelligent woman and her, uh, her uh, ethical doctor, and it will be no one else's business. That's what I propose. Now, I think people can agree. Mm -hmm. Now, I do. But, but, here's, but here's the question. You're, you're, you're laying out a, uh, a world in which rational people look at the evidence and kind of agree because logic and data drives them to the same place. You, yes. you, you may know I'm a trained hypnotist. And the first thing mm -hmm. you learn is that you don't live in that world. Mm -hmm. the, the first thing you learn as a hypnotist is that people, are, uh, people make decisions first. They rationalize them after the fact, but they don't know they did that. And then they get in an argument with you about how they arrived at their decisions through their logic and data when nothing like that happened. So you, you've heard, that's so true. You, you've heard the famous saying that you can't talk somebody, you can't use reason to talk somebody out of an opinion that they did not arrive at through reason. And that's that's nine out of ten decisions. So when you talk about something like abortion, that more than anything else is driven by your ickiness feeling about a fetus, in my opinion. If you're thinking of a fetus and you go, oh my God, that's like a person, and if you ended it, you'd be murder, nobody can talk you out of that. That's literally what you see and feel. It's not a reason. If somebody else says, well, it has no memory, it's not, I mean, it looks like something, but... Yeah. Well, but they're just sales. assuming all that. <clears throat> What's that? Uh, they're just assuming that it doesn't feel pain, but they have done studies about a fetus feeling pain. I, I don't think And I think that should be factored in. I just do because I'm, I am I like humanity and I like keeping mine. I, I, like, I like your idea of that as a standard. I just don't think you can get people to agree with that standard. Well, I know, but look at what they do agree with, Scott. Why not? Why couldn't we do the right thing for once at the right time with the right people for the right reason? We're, we're not rational. People. We don't have to keep being Murphy. Well, we kind of do. <laughs> we, 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 kinda, we, we kind of don't have the option of suddenly becoming rational. It's just not. It's just not well, we do, though. Why do you say that? Uh, we you really don't believe we do? No, not even a little bit. No. That, that's <laughs> the. the <laughs> The the the, 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 the the hypnosis point of view is that it's all rationalization after the fact. The exceptions to that would be like balancing your checkbook or looking for a, a sale at the at the store. Like that could be rational, you know, picking the best route to your destination. But anything that has an emotional uh, weight to it at all is one hundred percent. How does it feel? And then can I build an argument around how I feel? I just hope we evolve to the next level quickly. I really think we'll have to. Well, take take the simplest uh, situation. I guess you could call it simple. Um, climate change. Climate change, in theory, is so studied that we should not have any disagreement about what it is or where it's going. But you can see that um, there's no amount of data, logic, argument on either side. I'm not taking a side now. At the moment, I'm just talking about it from the big picture. Um, there's no amount of anything that's going to change anybody's opinion on that, except for this, this little sliver of people who actually weren't committed one way or the other. You know, sometimes you can, you can bend a few in the middle. But do, do you think you're going to get Greta to say, you know what, after I thought about it, fossil fuels would be terrific? You know, it's just not going to happen. I think it will happen. Because I think it's already happening. Like, for instance, the major proponents of climate change say the oceans are rising, but they all went and bought a beachfront mansion for millions of dollars. So obviously they, don't, they know it's bullshit. Oh, let me push so back. So you don't need to go Hold farther on. than that. Hold on. Let me, let me push back on that. I'm going to put the rich, okay. person, the rich person filter. If I have enough money, I'm going to buy a beach house, and if it goes underwater, I don't care. It's my third hour. What if you're in it? No, they live in well, it, Scott. 
It's not well, a vacation. If you're, yeah, no, I mean, you're talking about the rich people. The rich people mm-hmm. with the beach homes can take the risk that the beach home goes underwater. Yeah, but what if they're in it and it happens while they're asleep? <laughs> well, that ain't thinking clearly. Well, if it's a hurricane, you usually get a little warning. Yeah. Yeah, I, I personally would not live anywhere where I had to pack up because something on the news happened. Right. I don't want. I don't want to be listening to the news and the news says, you know, people in your zip code, you really ought to get in your car and drive as fast as you can this way. Like I, <laughs> like, like I never want to hear that. I, I just want to watch. The no, news. because you know, everybody, it'll be the worst traffic jam. You'll die out there. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to make it out of your city. Can you imagine people? They buy that bullshit. Get a motorcycle. But they won't go. Let's have a rational conversation. Well, I know people are stupid, if that's what you mean. Well, that's one way to put it. No, I, I like to say irrational. <laughs> I like to say irrational because then that that's that doesn't. Um, I don't like to hold myself outside that category because being human, I must have as many irrational, you know, opinions that are, that are actually nonsense, but they seem totally reasonable to me. I just don't know what they are. the The nature of uh, irrationality is that you always think it's the other person. I don't assume yeah. that I'm I don't assume that I'm somehow immune to that. I just don't know where my blind spots are. I know where they are. <laughs> well well I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad I'm here to find not out. Not yours. Oh. Not yours, but in general. Something that pisses you off about another person, it pisses you off because you're seeing yourself and that's God telling you, hey, that's what you hate about yourself, but you don't know it. Take you know, a look in the mirror. You know, that's, uh, yeah, that's a special case of the larger thing, I believe, which is we, we evaluate everything as a uh, version of ourselves. I mean, every person, every yeah. object, it, it's all just, it's me, but it's broken, so I don't like it. It's like a bad version of me. So that's sort of a, yeah, a deeper thought there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's me and everybody else. And they're all the other. <laughs> and they're all wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's really childish. But after you see, do you have children, Scott? Uh, stepkids from prior marriage. Well, you know how people just learn stuff the older they get and the more they grow up. They do. Uh, for the most part, I think, get more rational. Do you agree? Um, they have more rational capabilities, definitely, because you know, after 25, your brain is sort of locked in and starts to work the way it's supposed to. So there's definitely that, and there's definitely more knowledge and more context. I, I can tell you that I feel, yeah, like, a, I feel like a god at my, at my age. I'll bet you have the same feeling, because something will come up in the news, and I already know the context, because I lived it. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. For example, uh, there are people who are worried that the, the world is going to hell, and maybe they're right. But my context is I was born into that world. I was born into we're going to be nuked by Soviet Union any moment. Uh, the ozone mm-hmm. layer is going. All the hippies will no right. longer work. The economy will crumble because of the long hair. The drugs will destroy <laughs> us. You know, We're getting closer to that now. But uh, well, this is what my 25th... Uh, crisis that's going to end the world, eventually right. you get on that the business model of the news is to sell you crises. Mm-hmm. Once you get that, yeah. the next crisis starts looking like the old ones. You're like, oh. Now, I, I have something I call the Adam's Law of Slow-Moving Disasters, which says <laughs> that throughout history, if you could see a disaster coming from a long way away, such as we're going to run out of food because there's too many people. Nope. Fine. We're going to run out of fuel. Nope. We found a way to frack. We have plenty of fuel. So we're really good if we have notice. The things we're bad at is, oops, COVID. We're really bad at that. But you give you give us a five-year warning or with climate change, a 20-year warning, pretty darn good at that. So climate change worries me almost not at all because uh, yeah, I think our ability, our ability to fix it and adjust... I think deaths from deaths from extreme weather are down ninety eight percent over the last few decades. Right. 
Um, so yeah, there might be bigger hurricanes. Some places will get hotter. Some places won't. We'll adjust. We always do. Yeah, I think that too. How old are you? If I can I'm ask. 66. I'm 70. So I'm older than you. Ha ha. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> wasn't there, uh, I realized when I was a kid, I was pretty sure I was supposed to be retired now. Yeah. That, that didn't work out. No, that didn't work out. And there, I read, I just read in uh, online the other day that Americans of our age group are afraid they can never retire. I'll tell you, I don't understand how how people our age will retire unless they had pretty big careers. Like I, I do the math, and I think I don't know how this works. But I also think that you what I think what you're going to see is you're going to see a lot of people who have a house get a bunch of roommates. Mm-hmm. And maybe mm-hmm. absolutely, be, and they may be less lonely than they were before. So we have infinite mm-hmm. capacity to figure out how to re-engineer and solve stuff. So we've got a. a That's why I think epidemic. we're. Yeah, right. loneliness. I think epidemic. we're going to awaken to our need for each other and bring more love and and compassion into it, and forget our cruelty and our need to be right. And I think it's going to be a great correction for us. I think COVID was the. You know, the quarantine was the beginning of that. We had to stay with our horrible families and work out a lot of our problems. You know? Quite a a torture. How did that work? How did that work out? (laughs) In some ways. Uh, I'm not married anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Very few people survived it on that level. I think it was it. Yeah, my my marriage didn't didn't survive COVID. No, a lot of people's didn't. A lot lot of people, but, you know. I guess it's like if you're able to change or not. Speaking of change, I got hypnotized and it 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 uh, it was something else. Hey, could you really? hypnotize me into quitting smoking? You know, you don't do that kind of shit. Story. No, I, I, actually, that was the thing that got me into uh, hypnosis in the first place. My mother was hypnotized when she gave birth. To, uh, to my sister, and she didn't have she didn't have any painkillers. She says maybe maybe she doesn't remember, but she said no painkillers and no pain, and she was aware the entire time. But the family doctor was the one who who hypnotized her in the in the hospital before birth. Uh, but also he tried to get her to quit smoking. Now that didn't work, uh, and I didn't know mm-hmm. that until she died of uh, she died of lung cancer. Decades later, I actually thought she quit smoking. <laughs> she she's told us she did, but she, she was a secret. Oh, she smoker. lied. Yeah, yeah. Secret she smoker. sneak off and smoke. She was a she was a sneaky smoker. Yeah. Oh, so God. anyway, uh, that's what got me interested in it. But uh, the the answer to your specific question is that hypnosis doesn't work super well for losing weight or quitting a habit that you enjoy. It would be really good for, say, curing stage fright, because nobody wants the enjoyment of stage fright. But you kind of like the right. cigarette, right? right. So uh, mm-hmm. how about fear of flying? F- fear of flying. Very good, because nobody wants to keep that. Or performing better in your sport. You know, you might visualize this. Everybody wants to do better. There's, there's no counter force. But as soon as you've got a counter force, like you really, really like the taste of that food and you really, really like that cigarette, uh, hypnosis works as well as, but not better than, almost any other technique. I think there are a few that might be medic, um, there might be some meds now that make a difference, I'm not sure. But in the old days, uh, about 30% of the people would get a benefit of quitting smoking. But as the hypnotist who instructed me uh, taught us, the people who quit smoking would have quit with every other technique as well. And it's the difference oh. between wanting to do something and deciding. Mm-hmm. The people who want to do it are it looking for decision. somebody. Yeah, they're, they're looking for somebody to do it for them. I want it. Right. Could, you do, could you give me some willpower somehow with a, a pill or something? Yeah. But the people who just say, I always tell, huh? Yeah, the people who say, I'm done, they're just done. And every, every technique works because they're done. I always, when I meet Christian people, I say, can you pray for me to quit smoking? And then when I don't, I say, you ain't praying hard enough. 
<laughs> but uh, yeah, I know it's my fault. But uh, you know, hypnosis—that's kind of programming your brain, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's essentially that's the background behind this book. So it's got uh, over 100. What are you telling people to do in that book? Are you telling them to do repetition? What kind of things can you tell us about programming our brain? Yeah, I'll give, I'll, here? Give, I'll give you the simplest one. Um, some years ago, I used the reframe that alcohol is poison. Now, reframes don't have to be actually technically correct or logical. They just have to work. Now, when I said that, I thought it was just an interesting reframe that was working for me because I, I don't drink anymore. And um, I, a whole bunch of people told me they stopped drinking forever with that one sentence because instead of looking at it as a beverage, if you think of it, if you think your alcohol is a beverage, you're going to drink it because, hey, it's dinner, I have a beverage. If you tell yourself it's poison, you don't drink poison with dinner. And that although you say to yourself, you say to yourself, well, but wait, Scott, uh, my logical brain knows it's the same thing before or after the words I use don't make any difference. But here's what the hypnotists know that the public doesn't. The words are your program. The words they are. are. You know what? That is so right. And that's why I wanted to be on TV. Uh, that is so right. Words, everything is strung together with words. I'll tell you this one thing I did because I like doing that. Well, I was in my car and I had quit smoking. So I was real self-righteous because I quit all the time. And I was real self-righteous about it. And I saw this young girl in her car next to me smoking. So I rolled down my window. She looked over and she's like, she could, because I was famous then. And she's just staring at me with her cigarette. And I go, you need to stop smoking now. <laughs> and she goes, oh my God, Roseanne Barr is telling me that I need to, and I was thinking about stopping smoking. Okay. She threw it out the window. She goes, that's it. I'm done. And I, I like doing that, you know. And then she died of lung life. cancer. So, so no, here's, she, I hope she did. <laughs> here, here's, the, here's the hypnotist explanation of what happened. And I talk about this mm -hmm. in the book as well. Reframe your brain. Um, that people need a fake because. A reason that sounds like a reason but isn't really a reason. When... <laughs> Right. When when famous Roseanne said you need to quit smoking, that was a fake because. But did it work? I'll bet it did. If, if I had to I bet on it, she's got a story that she can tell for the rest of her life. And that's a, a fake reason why she actually quit. You can give yourself fake reasons. And I actually teach you how to do it uh, because your brain is not a, a rational engine. It's a word engine. If you put the right words in, you're going to get the right actions right. out. Right. That is so right. And by the way. I that, know. By the way, the the AI that we have now that's based on nothing but language patterns is confirmation of what the hypnotists always knew, that if you simply combine words, it looks like intelligence. So the intelligence we're getting out of AI is sort of like a, a fake intelligence. It's really just pattern recognition. But that's what we do. Humans are no different. So I think I have an opinion, but what I really have is an understanding that these sets of words fit together in a pattern. That is not yeah. thinking or reason. It's simply pattern right. recognition. It's like, oh, under this situation, I produce these words because that's what most people do. They're associated with the topic. And so we think we're thinking, but almost yeah. never. Almost never. You... It's like wizardry, isn't it? All it is is pattern recognition, but if you don't know that's all it is, it's like a magic trick. So yes, to your point. Do you use it when you tweet, Scott? Sometimes my, my hypnosis knowledge. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's more like a uh, an understanding. So there's technique, but if you've if you've lived it and breathed it and worked with it for years, uh, I write it without thinking about it. So it all, it's almost like typing with, you know, if you're a touch typer, I don't think I'll, I'll say this in a persuasive way, but it's also the only way I know how to write at this point. So it's just automatic. Mm -hmm. What about persuasion? I wanted to talk to you about persuasion. Yeah. So persuasion is the, the umbrella under which everything from marketing to sales, propaganda, hypnosis, they all fall under there and they all have common elements. So that's my larger field is, is persuasion. 
and hypnosis would just be one thing I learned. But, you know, all forms of communication have an element of persuasion in them if you're doing it right. So I've simply Mm -hmm. learned those little techniques uh, and incorporated them in my normal presentation. For example, I'll give you an example. Um, Vivek Ramaswamy was on an interview recently talking about climate change. He had a different Mm -hmm. view than the host. But what he did before he went into his different parts is he said that he agreed that the climate is warming. Now, I'm, I'm not getting into a discussion about climate. I'm just giving you an example of persuasion. Mm-hmm. He said, I agree the, the planet is warming and that humans caused it. By agreeing with her first, he, he's, he's got you on his side. That's called pacing. Right. Uh-huh. And then he can right. leave. It's called what? Pacing. You, you pace the person you're trying to persuade by agreeing with them or matching them in some way. For example, mm-hmm. if I were pacing you, I would have, uh, you know, maybe dressed the same way you're dressing or the same style. I might have, uh, you know, I might have leaned the way you're leaning. I might have used the words you you use. So, for example, if you were a person who talked in military terms, it's usually guys, but if they said stuff like, well, we're going to take that hill tomorrow and, you know, somebody jumped on that hand grenade, if I were pacing you, then I would say, yeah, you got to get the troops to be marching in one direction, and you know you can't go to war without uh, ammunition. Mm-hmm. And then they would, without realizing it, they would say, you know, you and I are basically the same person because the things right. coming out mm-hmm. of your mouth they're they're in my head, and as I'm thinking them, you're saying them, or you're saying what I could have thought in that situation. So the next thing I say, you're you're convinced that we're the same person. Now mm-hmm. that's an exaggeration. But I'm saying that if your friend says something's true, you're more likely to agree than an enemy. Because the friend is a version of you. That's why they're a friend. An enemy is the opposite of you, so you like reject that. So you, mm-hmm. you become the person you're trying to influence long enough for them to be comfortable with your message. So that's just one thing. So yeah, you, you, Well, are you that you, in for sales or just for human? Compassion or communication. That's that's everything from personal relationships to marketing to sales, everything. So persuasion is in everything we do. We're, you can either be good at it or bad at it, but you never are not doing it, right? We're all selling a yeah. of ourselves all the time. Yeah, I can get that with my grandkids, like trying to persuade them to choose the right thing. I can, you know, I, I get that with... The, hey, buddy, I hate your parents, too, and I'm on your <laughs> side. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, yeah, it is kind of that. Well, one of the reframes in the book is I had to talk to a teenager, and one of the tricks that I give, and by the way, there's no good way to talk to a teenager. So if you think <laughs> you're going to, like, you know, you've, you've got the silver bullet or something, no, no. You, you can do a little bit better. That's all. That's all you can do. But one of the reframes <laughs> is uh, I, I use this with my, my stepson, who's deceased now, uh, I would tell him that uh, uh, it's two against one whenever I disagreed with him because I'd say, look, here's the deal. My job is to report to your future self. I don't report to you. But your future oh, I love self, that. when you're an adult, you're going to hold me responsible for this situation. That's right. Mm-hmm. That future you and me are on the same side. And that future you is going to be pissed if I let you do this. Because it's going to look back and say, "Why did you let me do that? Like I didn't, I didn't learn any discipline, right?" Mm-hmm. So That's the, right. the young kid doesn't want to understand that and doesn't want to agree that you're on the same side as their future self, but they also don't have much to say about it, <laughs> right? It's hard to push that's back. Good. Uh, so that's good. Yeah. So that's one reframe. I call that accessing the future to work for you in the now. Yeah, that would that would be a everything. Problem. I think is for how to manipulate children to get them <laughs> out of this a, a morass of mind control they're under. Mm. I feel bad for them. They they can't even think. I'm in agony over that. Well, let's, let me give you the best optimistic take on the children of tomorrow. Okay. I don't think it's ever been true that more than ten percent of the kids made a difference anyway. Meaning that the the ones who built the startups and you know turned became Apple and like that, it's not many people, and those people probably are unfazed by the the nonsense. Not, in other words, if there's a Steve Jobs born today, 
he's still Steve Jobs. Like, he, he still emerges. There, there's nothing that can stop him. Nothing would have stopped Bill Gates, right? Maybe it wasn't yeah. Microsoft, but he had the goods, right? He had all the tools. So he was, he was going to do something no matter what. And I think that that doesn't change. I think from the, the 60s, again, going back to my youth, you know, we saw the, the, the kids seem to be tuning out and dropping out, and it looked like the youth had lost all their, all their interest in hard work and all those things that kept the country together. And then the country just kept getting stronger. And, and every, every generation, you know, every 10 years, we're like, oh, this generation, this, you know, generation X, Y, whatever, they're all bad. And then it never really happens because every generation produces their 10%. Who do all the important stuff? The the rest are working; they're contributing, but their their individual differences not that important to the whole. So as long as we're producing superstars, and I don't think you could turn it off. I mean, it's it's just the the luck of the genetics. Kid comes out, they're just a superstar. I don't think there's anything in our society that can hold back a superstar. I don't think. Well, that a- I I don't either, but I. I just, you know, wish that the regular human that ain't a superstar could make better decisions for themselves. So they aren't like, you know, so they're, they have more sovereignty in their, in their lives and communities. I get tired of seeing people used as social experiments for freaks. <laughs> yeah, you know, but do you think it's getting worse or are we just more aware? Yeah. I know. No, you don't think we're uh, just more well, aware of it? I think we're more aware of it, but I do think it's getting worse. But yeah, it's more. It, there's more of them now. There's more more people at their disposal to do their bidding now, and they take more and more freedom from them, and give them less and less education. Yeah, I think it's way different. Maybe it's not. Maybe if you go back to feudalist times, it ain't different from that. It's like a return to feudalism. <laughs> you know, the, the thing about the, the future is that it's uh, fundamentally unpredictable. Mm-hmm. And there are so many things that are boiling around right now that, that could change just completely what it looks like five years from now. I mean, if you add AI to the mm-hmm. fact that they may have this super conductivity working, I'm not totally convinced. So, you know, by the time people see this, maybe it's debunked. But if that works, superconductivity plus AI plus quantum computers plus fusion energy forever, these are all the things that would be enabled by these technologies. Everything's different. We, we could get to the point where energy is close to free in, say, 20 years. And what happens when energy is close to free? Because every economy that succeeds does it on the back of energy. Right. If you don't have energy, you're not going anywhere. And if you do, you probably almost be certainly be fine. Every country that's got a lot of energy seems to have a, you know, a plus. So, I don't know. The the future is fundamentally unpredictable, but there's a whole bunch of good stuff happening. That yeah, there is. Is at least as powerful as the bad stuff. I think it's more powerful than the bad stuff, and that's why I say I think because of all the good that's incoming because of. The, I mean, of course, we could use technology to ruin everything, which we are good at. But I think uh, I think we might get a chance to better ourselves and improve our situation and therefore think more clearly. I think that's coming. You know, one of the things that, um, that I've noticed because I have a background in economics, so my education is economics, and then I got an MBA. And what they teach you is how to compare things properly so that you're not mm-hmm. comparing to some magical thought in your mind of how things should be. Compare mm-hmm. to the actual options. And right. what I've observed is that when I meet people who have the same background as me, we usually agree r- right away. Or if we don't, there's an assumption that we can see, oh, you, you believe that'll happen but I have a different assumption. So you end up agreeing or getting really close to it if you've learned how to make decisions. And that, that's a, right. a field that teaches you specifically, do this or do this, how do, you, how do you analyze these? So when I talk to what I'll call normies, you know, regular people who might have even a college degree, could be in math, 
could be in a variety of things. But if it's not in a decision-making field, you believe you can do it, but you can't. And I, mm-hmm. and I had that experience when I became a cartoonist because I'm not very good at drawing. People told me early in my career, you know, there's nothing you're doing that I couldn't do. Like I could no, write they told me that. Yeah, right. I, I could write that. I, I could do that comic. But of course, they never did. Right. <laughs> so mm-hmm. people sometimes look at things and think as simple, such as decision making. And they think this is something that any ordinary person could do. I could look at the costs. I could look at the benefits. Anybody can do it. But indeed, it's a learned skill. Uh, it my is native a intelligence, skill. Right, My native intelligence, which I like to think is pretty good, I don't think would help me without the actual training and the discipline to always make sure I'm looking at the base case, always looking at the do nothing. Uh, I, know what's, I know what a sunk cost is, you know, that sort of thing. So, for example, when we look at the uh, economic models or the prediction models of climate change, as a trained person in the field of decision-making, it looks like an absurdity to me. Because, first of all, there are too many variables. Second of all, there are hundreds of, uh, hundreds of models. And then as new information comes in, they throw away some of the models that didn't work and tell you that these models were predictive. But they weren't predictive. There were just hundreds of them, and some of them had to be close. So as they're throwing away the ones that fail, they, they just by survivorship, there's something left. There always was going to be something that was close. It doesn't mean it predicted. Now, that's obvious to me because you know I have some background, but that would totally be not obvious to an ordinary consumer of news. They would say, are you telling me that all the scientists say this is valid? And they'll look at you and say, yes, all the scientists. Well, 98%, 2% are crazy, but 98% say this is a valid, smart thing. It never was. Not only are right. the, models, the models are not a science, they're based on humans making assumptions that go into them, and that drives the result. I know this because that was my job. I used to work at a big corporation to predict you know, the, our economic future, and I would have to make assumptions. The assumptions right. of the model, not the data. <laughs> it was just whatever right. I decided was sort of truish. I put in there. Well, that's how they do is they get in a room and decide how much money's worth. It's all fantasy. Well, yeah, there are definitely people deciding what reality is, the reality that we see. So, so the point being that um, also, if you're looking at, let's like, say, a 50-year uh, climate model, which part of that mm-hmm. predicted that we would have superconductivity this year? None. <laughs> Which part of the model predicted that uh, Sam Altman's other startup would uh, make fusion work, at least in the lab? None. Right? So the, the biggest variables are all positive, you know, in, in the sense that there are technologies coming online. The models don't account for that. So the biggest part of the future these enormous social scientific breakthroughs, that's the biggest part of the future. They're not in the models because no model can predict that. So That's right. So, so I look at it and say, okay, I'm pretty sure we can get on top of all these problems. Maybe the sea level rises. We can fix that. <laughs> you know, just move yeah. back, move back, build the dike, do something. Build a boat. <laughs> live, on, live, live, live on a boat. We, we now have um, desalinization, especially as energy, I know. energy costs come down. We can live on the ocean. You can build a city on the ocean. And that's what right. maybe that's what 30 years from now looks like. Because there is, there, is, yeah. there is talk that it's now practical. And then if you're on the ocean, maybe you move your city based on the season or the hurricane pattern. Yeah, you, right. you, you can easily imagine a future where hurricanes are irrelevant. You know, you know what the yes, absolutely. I'll tell, I'll tell you what the, the most, it has to start with thinking, words, imagination before it can you know manifest it in the world. But I think that's what they're trying to lock down is our ability to you know well, I mean our not ability well, our desire to create and imagine and think. They're trying to lock all that down and question. They're trying to get rid of that out of us. Yeah, the other, the other thing that nobody can predict is um, what somebody thinks of that nobody thought of before. Uh, here's one of my favorite examples. 
So climate change and hurricanes, you know, we've got some predicted danger there. But most of our hurricanes, at least on the, the Atlantic side, they form because the desert in northern Africa is super hot at some season. And that, that causes the, the, the sequence of events. But suppose we got our desalinization better. We use livestock, right. livestock, which is another way to build greenery on deserts. You just let the, the cows mm-hmm. wander around and poop on stuff. And the next thing you know, mm-hmm. that your vegetation's moved 10 feet into the poop. And you just let them keep wandering yes, around. That's right. 10 years later, you got a forest just from cows wandering around pooping. So we have the technology. To turn a super yeah, do. to turn a super hot place into a slightly cooler one if we wanted to, and that would actually change the nature of hurricanes. <laughs> now, I'm well, not that's sure what I'm true. saying. We have the ability to make this place way better, and I don't. I do think that a lot of us, maybe that ten percent you were talking about before, but the ten percent that matter, a lot of us know that that we can improve things, and uh, you know. I think we'll make it happen. I really do. I, I just feel it. I see, yeah, I mean, I see evidence of it. I, I think our smartest people are smarter than they've ever been smart. And there, there's no way to quantify um, the impact of brilliance, of, of literal genius on our future. Because it's the geniuses that are changing stuff. And you don't see that coming until it comes. You know, I didn't see superconductivity at room temperature a month ago, <laughs> but somebody got it. Maybe. I hope so. I interviewed a guy in uh, 1985 that was making a car work on uh, V8 cans full of water with some uh, infrastructure hydrogen. around it. I, I'm, yeah. I'm going to say that was a fraud. <laughs> no, it worked. <laughs> I wrote about it for a magazine. I mean, he had a generator and the whole thing, and I, I can't remember exactly how, but that was how he made the fuel. It was cans with full of water in a tank, and then he put them in the car. They were charged up. Ben Franklin I used swear. to do that. He played with cans of water, and that's how he developed the battery or helped develop it. <laughs> so you might be on to something. Ben Franklin thing. battery. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Um, I never can't know. remember enough to talk about it, but I did see it with my own eyes. Unless it was um, a magic trick, I don't know. But do you eyes. believe that we're going to have Nassara and Gassara with your MBA in economics? That's what everybody's saying is coming. Wait, we're going to have what are we going to have? Gassara, Gassara, G E S A R A. Was that, that a virus or something? What is that? <laughs> no, it's a redistribution of gold. Oh, I don't. I'm not even up to date on that story. I don't know oh, that's okay. Like. Well, that's what they say. You know, gold backed currency that America will be having that soon. Don't you don't you think it's just going to all turn digital? It has to, doesn't it? Yeah. No, because I, I they're trying. I think that's the reset that they want is that we move to digital. But I think that there's another well, another thing coming. But, look, but, but let me ask you this: Can you even imagine? Let's say put your imagination 20 years in the future. Is there any way in 20 years you're paying for things with pieces of paper that you had in your wallet in 20 years? No, there's no way. Paper. No way. No. So it's all going to be digital. I, I would say that. No, I don't think so. I think we'll time. be taking a chicken to the doctor to heal us. <laughs> Barter. <laughs> it's probably what's going to happen. And then, well, when we live in the feudal state. Uh, and then you find of, you that uh, you're oligarchy. Lo- then you'll be lonely because your chicken was your only friend. So you got to be careful. <laughs> with no, but I, I think we're going to have a, a better system. I think we're going to come up with something better that actually serves the many instead of the few at the expense of the many. You know, I do. I think, I, I we think are. we're. I think we're dangerously close to not needing people to work. That's that's one of my big yeah. concerns. Because once you get free energy, uh, you can make your robots build more robots. You can make them mine the ore, and pretty soon you've got a completely, you know, a self. You you could build an economy that didn't require people, except for maybe giving some orders to some robots now and then, because the robots can build well, robots. Well, the energy will come. They can find. They can mine. 
basically they can just do anything we want. Uh, well, what are people well, going to do in that world? Die. <laughs> well, I, some of them are going to merge with the robots, according to Elon Musk, and I agree with that. I think we'll have chips in our heads, and the and for a long time in human history, well, actually, it'll be a short time in the universe, but in human history, I think there's going to be a period where we're legitimately cyborgs uh, in every sense. I wonder about that, too. Uh, I don't wonder. I think that's guaranteed. Really? Now, what might happen? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah that's guaranteed. Yeah, well, some percentage of the humans, not all of them. I mean, there will be people who stay natural, but some percentage of people are going to put the chip in and they're going to be able to yeah. directly interface. They're already the, paying it. Hopefully, I think that's home. true. Yeah, yeah, they're that's right. And then they'll pay. have a yeah. cyborg girlfriend that looks like Pamela Anderson, the, the, they already the do Stepford that. wife they've already dreamed, always dreamed of, yeah. you know, and the women will have, uh, Rock Hudson, whoever it is, it's probably not Rock Hudson, but that's another story. <laughs> yeah, well, it's programmable. No, I, so I it can't could think be. of who's hot, but you know oh, that's what right. I mean. Well, that's right. He's he's gays, but you know you could program Rock. Well, Hudson you know, like the straight. perfect man, and then they'll just program it to say, "You're right, dear. I love you. <laughs> I, what else I can like, I do for you?" I, I feel like the sex bots will be programmable. So if you get tired yes. of yours, you can you can like change it to. All right, now you're gay. I'm just going to try this out for a while. But, uh, yeah, if this exactly. Doesn't work, we'll, we'll update your software again until we get something we like. I think uh, that that's the way it has to go, the way it's headed. Uh, you know, I think that at least 30% of the male public will prefer digital girlfriends. because I do too. Because they're, that's a low you know, number, actually. You're, I think it's probably closer normal. to 50. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. I was going to say 50, so I'm not going to argue with 80. that at all. <laughs> but <laughs> why? But, but you already see it. terrible. But you see it in dating apps, right? The dating apps <laughs> have made the top 1% of guys golden, so they're getting all the, mm-hmm. all the women. And the rest of the guys have no women. And then mm-hmm. when those women have uh, been run through properly, they try to get married, <laughs> and the other guys are like, Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe you not. Have a sex robot. <laughs> you missed out. I, I got an alternative right over here. Yeah. No, the, no that the is funny, what's happening. The, the funniest thing about the sex robots, which are certainly going to be better and better every year, is that uh, is that <laughs> women were abusing women were abusing nerds for a hundred years, and, and they didn't <laughs> see there would be a blowback. <laughs> the, the nerds actually replaced women. <laughs> it's like what the, did you, you nerds? Yeah, the nerds. The nerds, oh. the technology people, they, they're they like, all right, if you're going to abuse us for 100 years, you just wait. Yeah. I see. I you can wait. see the genius behind that. That's well, happening. it might be better for men. It might be better for women, too, to just have an agreeable partner that you didn't have to take out all of your personal PTSD with <laughs> constantly and call that a relationship. Well, my idea doesn't, it looks like it's not going to catch on. My idea was that <laughs> your your spouse, the person you married, would be the only person you can't have sex with. <laughs> Everybody else is fair game. <laughs> like, didn't go over. But, really, when, well, when you get married, you basically show your worst side to your spouse because you can't really hide it at that point. So right. why is the only person you could have sex with the only person who showed you all their flaws and blah, you know? <laughs> right? <laughs> like what, I had what a joke about that. I had like, well, you know, you don't want to have sex because you know them. <laughs> 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 yeah, because I mean, where's the mystery in seeing somebody on the toilet? I mean, you know, the romance. You just it. What? It's just <laughs> over. I yeah. think people will probably stop having sex because, you know, it's deadly and it's a, you know, it's, deadly. it's not going to add up. <laughs> well, if, if, the, if the robots are stepping up, I think you're right. They got to yeah. step up, though. Gotta, well, the women the have been using the robots since they came out, what, then in the 70s, all the That's vibrators. True. And so, you know, I don't right. know. It kind of makes sense. People are pretty much chronic masturbators anyway. They don't really want to love nobody or talk to them. 
So here, here's a topic I can only say here, which is I'm pretty sure the womanizer will destroy civilization. Do you know the womanizer? Mm-hmm. A, a special kind of sex toy for women that doesn't work. Oh, no, I thought you were talking about like a lothario, but okay. For oh, man, no. I thought you yeah. were talking about No, he's talking men. about a, a vibrator. Product. I've never seen it. I'm going to order it right now for a hand. So it's a product that instead of vibration, which, you know, was pretty good, it, it I won't give you more description, but it does some kind of a sucking clitoral thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 But, but I'm told... <laughs> That face. <laughs> People told. make me sick. God. <laughs> well, I'm, <laughs> I'm interested. All right. So I'm told that it's like a, a whole level above whatever existed before, such yeah. that it's so good that, you know, it's becoming a replacement for actual men. And mm-hmm. I don't mean that as hyperbole. You know, I mean, I mean, that's like 5% of mm-hmm. people just like backing out and say, you know, Maybe uh, people could just be friends, which would be good. You know, you'd be friends with the opposite sex rather than, you know, rushing to them to solve all your daddy issues and your mommy problems and using them forever. <laughs> just be friends and take care of your own business, for God's sake. The world would probably be a way better place. This is the most uh, optimistic well, I've been in a long time with you two. I just want you to know, I feel the first time I feel good about the future, and I'm not even trying to be funny. Oh, I, future- the future is going to be this fine. Is a, this has been a great, and exp, even though it's all about the future <laughs> of dildos and sex robots and stuff, it looks good. I'm excited. What, what the are? hell? <laughs> I, I, I like the big three. Uh, I like to talk about, you know, AI, robots, and, and dildos. If you've covered <laughs> that field, everything else is sort of, sort of ancillary. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. But we talked about racism, the media, persuasion, programming your brain. Uh, You know, most people believe what most people believe and don't think. We talked about the indictment. Come on, man. We've done, we've had a lot, we've had a great conversation. I so enjoyed it. You are so smart, so interesting. And I thank you so much for being my guest today. You know, I am, uh, I think I may have mentioned this, but you don't know how many podcasts I turned down since I got canceled. You know, I, I did a few up front just to get my message out, and then I went silent. But as soon as, soon as I, I heard that you were uh, interested, I said to myself, I got to talk to the other disgraced artist. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, you maybe you could use this too. Um, I like to call myself not canceled, but disgraced. Uh, which I kind of like. I like that. I kind of like being disgraced. Uh, you know, there's some <laughs> there's some jobs where it can add it can add <laughs> just a little bit of flavor, right? <laughs> so it, yeah, the, the people don't know that I, I've continued doing the comic, but it's by subscription on Twitter and on the locals platform. So you can see it there for for subscription. But of course, it became much wilder. You know, when, once all the uh, the censorship was off. So I'm just having. The most fun. I mean, the the series I'm going to work on. I just I'm just going to start is I'm going to have uh, Dilbert looking at his 23 and Me and his DNA. He's, he starts looking. At, oh, I did that. He's going to start looking at his fourth cousins. They have like point oh 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 two percent. And he's going to be thinking, I could use this as a dating <laughs> app, but I, but, but I got to stay under point oh oh four because that's just crazy. Yeah, that, that's like family. dark Dilbert. Yeah, but point oh oh. You should hear about my family. The Jews are all married to their cousins in my family all the way through Europe. We all married. That's why we're so neurotic. I figured Mm -hmm. it out. Inbreeding. Because we're way too finely tuned, if you know what I mean. (laughs) I remember my mom setting me up with a guy when I was six. Well, I guess I was 16. And the first thing that came in my head when she said she had a nice Jewish boy for me to date, I guess I was 15. She goes, my first question, and I guess this isn't normal for non-Jewish people. Are we related to him? <laughs> and and it took her too long to answer. She goes like this. <laughs> well, so I knew, yeah. you know, took, took, I did not want to carry that on. Yeah, you don't want to get into the cause. You don't want to get into the conversation of a third cousin, a third cousin. <laughs> 
<laughs> fourth fourth cousin, world. definitely okay. Third cousin, mm. that's, my, yeah. that's my limit. I'm, I'm yeah. drawing the limit there. Yeah. <laughs> Do you believe in God before we go? Uh, I believe in the simulation. Or is that too personal? I believe that we are a simulated uh, uh, world, much like Elon Musk. And the, the quick argument for that is we already have the technology to build simulations that would act like they think they're real. We haven't done it, but we have all the tools to do that. Just make an NPC with AI and it thinks it's alive. So the argument is, if it's possible, what are the odds that we're the first ones to do it versus mm -hmm. some other entity already did it and we're one of their million simulations running on some computer and maybe we think we lived 100 years of our life, but maybe that was only a microsecond on somebody's computer. So, you know, that they may be, you know, reaching their finger for the off button and we go away forever. But in the time that it takes them the finger to get there, maybe we live hundreds of years, you know, the, the world. So the possibility is that just from, you know, statistical likelihood, the odds of us being after 14 billion years of this universe, there's exactly one human-like group of people who can build a simulation where the simulated people think they're real. Very unlikely. Far more likely right. it's happened a lot of times, like millions of times, billions, even trillions. And under that scenario, you have maybe a, a trillion to one odds that you're a digital creation, uh, which would give you a god your God would be the programmer who built your little simulation. Intelligent design. It would be intelligent design, yeah. Mm -hmm. The author. Yeah, yeah the author. That, that's what I think. Uh, and, We're living in the author's mind. Part of the reason that I go for this, and uh, I speculate that Musk might have a similar feeling, is that his, his life and mine, and maybe you would say this about yours as well, doesn't seem to conform to what you would expect of a normal life. In other words, you know, without getting into details, my life has been so extraordinary and so many things have happened that I, you know, did my, uh, my affirmations on and visualized. I mean, I became a number one best-selling author. I became one of the top cartoonists in the world when I was six years old. I decided that's exactly what I wanted to do. Then I had this weird fantasy that someday I'd be invited to the Oval Office and the president would ask me some questions just because he thought I'd have a good opinion. That actually fucking happened. Wow. <laughs> yeah, in 2018, Trump actually invited me to the Oval Office. I sat in the Oval Office, and we just chewed the fat. That's we're how just awesome. And now, when I look back at that, I say to myself, that is one of 25 things that are so unusual, and yet there were things unusual. I simply imagined and targeted. And without even knowing your whole story, I'll bet that you had a feeling that there was some kind of magic happening, and you were imagining your future, and the next thing you have, you know, top TV show in the world, and everything's weird. That, was yeah, that I imagined it as a child, and I worked to get it. But, you know, I cracked. I carefully honed my craft in order to get it. So I didn't so, just walk in there, hey, I'm taking over. Yeah. Uh, we we all the did craft. the work. Yeah, we all did the right. work. But but aren't there lots of people who did the work and they didn't get the result? So yeah, there are a lot of people who who did the work, but I don't know why they didn't make it and I did ultimately. I don't know why, because I thought they were just as good. Here's what I think. If we're a simulation, I, mm -hmm. I speculate that we can author it from within the simulation. In other words, that the, the visualization of your future uh, might be the mechanism by which you're actually steering yourself through infinite possibilities. Now, I, don't I believe to... that. I, I definitely believe that. I d I, I've been, uh, I got a head injury when I was 16, getting hit by this car. And since then, after a nightmare, 10 years of healing my brain concussion, my brain injury, I, I started having lucid dreams. Have you ever had those? Oh, yeah, of course. Oh, that's the real shit, ain't it? It's, it's the greatest. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's oh, awesome. I have to have you come back and discuss that. 
Definitely. Please come back again. I've so enjoyed speaking with you. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. Yeah, it was amazing, Scott. Thank you so You're much. You're up here in the penthouse of think, and I love it. <laughs> God bless you. Uh, th thanks so much for having me. The the time just zipped by. I'm, I assume we're we're at the we're end hour and a half. Yeah, one twenty eight. Uh, make sure you I'll tell you, take this to the bank. You are not in any way a racist. You are a deep thinker, and you can take that to the bank. Yeah. It's said by another person called a racist by the United States racist media. <laughs> uh, thank you. And I am a racist, and I'm telling you both here. <laughs> All right, make sure you leave your computer open, Scott. Will do. Uh, if you can. All right, I'm going to end the recording. At ease, man. At ease. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much. Oh, you see.